Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I believe, praise God. And we're going to start at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, whether black or white, whether old or young, whether male or female, all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, God has set the members, each one of them in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. Verse 21, and I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it. Look at verse 25. But there should be no schism or division in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. Verse 26. And if one member suffers... All the members suffer with it, or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Last week when I got home from church, after we had a glorious service, a great time together with each other, that Jesus was here. We just had a special time in service. I get home. And I turn the TV on or in social media, I check my phone, I get this alert that there had been a shooter in Texas that had came and, and in a little, little church and, and just shot up everybody in the church. His goal was to kill everybody in the church. And when I heard about that, immediately I was affected. Verse 26 stood out to me. He says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is affected, All the members are affected too. And I immediately was affected. I I immediately just felt this suffering on the inside of me. This devastation, this tragedy just affected me. Trying to watch football, trying to relax. and, And I was affected by what I was hearing and reading on the news. And then I began to hear all these questions. And one of the, one of the things the Lord told me, if something happens in our, in our world, we're not going to talk about everything that happens because things are happening all the time. But if something really happens in our, in our world that, that's affecting the church and I'm supposed to stop whatever I'm doing in that series, we're going to talk about it. And so we're going to talk about it today. And I, I, I saw on social media and I saw people where, where was God? Where is God? Why did God allow this to happen? And I saw other people saying things such as, you know, we, we need to do more than just pray. We need to, we need to, we need to fight back. We need to arm. We need to go after someone. We, we need justice. We need revenge. And all these questions and all these thoughts and all these statements, I think are legit. I think they're legit questions. Where, Where's God? Why did he allow it to happen? We serve a, a great God. And, and, and why was this 
allow it to take place and why didn't he stop it? Or, you know, hey, I, I understand, you know, prayer, we need to do more than just pray. I get that too. I get that statement. I get that way of thinking. In our men's group, we talked yesterday a little bit about this. Great conversation. And the Lord began to talk to me about some things. And I want to show you in Luke chapter 13. Turn there real quick in Luke chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 1. And I want to show you some things here. We are living in the last days. The Bible says that in the last days, difficult times, perilous times, dangerous times will take place in the last days. And we are in the last days. And if we see the third book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 13, verse 1, there were present at that season some who told him, talking about Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now look at me for a second. Apparently, Pilate, is a governor of a province at this time. And apparently, there were some people that were going to worship. They were going to sacrifice. They were in a place of worship. And it says here that Pilate had mingled their blood with the blood of the sacrifice. So there was killing that took place. Pilate had ordered killing to take place while they were worshiping. How evil. While they're trying to sacrifice and praise their God, Pilate ordered, and I did some study on this, that there were men that were in the place of worship that were dressed as if they were there to worship. And at a certain time, they they sprung up and, and, and mingled the blood with the sacrifice, killed them. This is what Pilate had ordered. If we look at verse 2, and Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Jesus' response stood out to me. He said, do you think that they did something wrong and that's why this happened to them? Do you think that you are better than them? And that's why it didn't happen to you or it happened to them? He, he says here in verse three, he says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now listen. All throughout this world, it is not in the world, in America it's a little different, but in the world, it's not too popular to be a Christian. Are you listening to me? In the world, uh, killing of Christians happens daily. Daily. Uh, in China, you, you have to go into the underground church because if you have a public church, they're going to arrest you and possibly kill you. So in America, we've been kind of pampered a bit. That, you know, we want our politicians to be Christians and we want the mayor and we want the lawyer and we want everybody to be a Christian. But, you know, Christianity is not really popular outside of the 50 states. And so things that happened like last week, which grieve my heart, are things that are very common outside of our country. If we're going to call ourselves a Christian, and if we're going to be proud to be a Christian, listen to me now, we're going to suffer persecution. I wish this could be a, a message that you can run around the church and jump up and down and, and shout and somebody fall out. I wish that this was going to be this message, but I've got to equip a strong body of believers for the times of head. I've got to get you a persecution is coming to America. Christianity is not as popular as it used to be. People hate Christians. And deeper than that, the enemy hates you. Satan himself hates you. Satan himself, what, what, it, his time is short. His time is running out. 
and he hates you. And the only tactic that he has to stop you is this tactic called fear. Fear is the only tactic, is the only weapon of arsonary that he possesses to stop you. You know, terrorism is the organized use of fear. If we can organize fear and then get you so afraid, then, you know, then we're, we're a terrorist group. We're using fear as a weapon. And so when I heard about this, I got a call from a friend of mine who doesn't go to church. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm his pastor now. You know, hadn't, he don't go to church. He, ne- you know, he doesn't crack the doors of the church, but he hears about the shooting and he, pastor. Oh, I'm your pastor. Okay. I, I thought church should be the safest place. That people could gather. Yeah, it should be. We should be able to come and worship together. It should be. But listen to me. There is no better way to leave this earth than to stand up for the name of Jesus Christ. To be a martyr in the name of Jesus. To not bow your knee and turn your head and say, well, you got a gun to me. I'm going to renounce Jesus. That's the cowardly way to leave this earth. There's no better way to leave than say, I stand believing in the name of Jesus. Matter of fact, the book of Romans says that there are, read it for yourself, that there are special rewards in heaven for people that die for the name of Jesus. And so we see in verse 3, Jesus says, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse four, he says, or those 18 on whom the tower in Shalom fell and killed them. So apparently there was a tragedy that took place that a tower fell and killed 18 people. Jesus said, do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is getting away from the question, why did this happen? And he's turning it to what does this mean to me? Listen to me. He's getting away from the question, why did this happen? And he's turning your attention to what does this mean? happening, this circumstance, this event, this tragedy, tragedy, what does this mean to me? He's getting our eyes off of, well, where was God? Why did this happen? And if I can truthfully answer this question in front of you guys publicly, I don't know what happened. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. Why did God allow that to happen? I don't know. I don't know. Where was God? I don't know. But here's what I do know. What does that event, how does that event affect me? How does that event change what I'm doing in my life? Jesus said it should cause us to repent. You hear about things over here. Why did it happen? That's not the question you should ask. The question you should be asking is, how does it affect me? And it should affect you. With repentance, changing your way of thinking, Lord, changing my way of believing, changing my way of acting. It should cause me to repent. It should cause you to not question God. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord. There are some things that are just secret and will not be revealed to you. But those things that are revealed belongs to you. But there are times we're not going to always get answers to the questions, but we can always answer the question, how does this affect me? How does this affect me? Yeah, I heard. Did you hear about what happened over there? Yeah, I heard about it. Did you hear about what happened over here? Yeah, I heard about it. Did you hear about what happened over there? I heard about that. But how does it affect me? And it should cause us to repent. It should cause us to change our mind, to change the way we think and to change the direction of our life. I'm going to come down here because I want to talk to you.
I think when we take a look at how it should affect us, it's got to cause us, I believe, to do, to think about three things. You know me, I like to sum things up very simply so you can take it home and remember. But I think the first thing it should, the way it should affect us is we have to resist the urge to fear. We have to literally fight this spirit of fear that that's running rampant in our news media. The media is the source of most of our fears. And we have to fight the re- to, to resist the spirit of fear to come. When when we heard about the shooting last week, I got I got a lot of pastor friends, a lot of pastor friends called and they had members of their churches call and they and people were just scared to death. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh, should we frisk people? Should we handcuff people? What are we going to do? What are we gonna, should we check people at the door? What are we going to do? And the spirit of fear is trying to get in the church. And if it can get in the church, it will paralyze us. Literally cause us not to move anymore. This fear, uh, you know, you hear something, the light flicker. Whoop, whoop, whoop. What was that? What was that? It was just the light. Calm down. Calm down. The spirit of fear is trying to take over you. In first, in, in, in second Timothy one seven, it says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. It is not from God and we're to resist it with everything we have for he has given us the spirit of power, the spirit of love and a sound mind. Fear affects your power. Fear affects your love and fear affects the way you think a sound mind. You will be unbalanced. Isaiah 41 10, 10 tells us it says, do not fear. The message Bible says, don't panic, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Glory be to God. Psalms 34, 4. It says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from what? All my fears. Hallelujah. We cannot allow fear to dictate and to dominate, not in this house and not in your house. You cannot allow fear to paralyze you. I remember when someone went out and shot up in the movies and the first thing the spirit of fear told me was don't go to the movies no more. And I thought, you know what? You're right, spirit of fear. We're not going to the movies. I said, wait a minute. No, we're going to the movies. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm not going to let the spirit of fear dictate and dominate in my life. The spirit of fear uh, is trying to control you. Control what you're thinking. People are, are just can't sleep at night. Panic attacks. The spirit of fear. The spirit of fear. I went and spoke at a church and the Lord told me to call up people for panic attacks and the altar was full of, full of ladies. And I looked around just internally. And I thought, where are the men at? And the Lord spoke to me and said, the men aren't bold enough to admit that they deal with panic attacks too. Yeah, what's a panic attack? You land in the bed and all of a sudden you wake up looking around. What's that? Spirit of fear trying to jump on you. What do you do? How do you get rid of spirit of fear? You have to do what 1 John 4, 18 tells us. There is no fear in love. For perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So if there's fear dominating your life, you need to develop the love that God has for you. God loves me. He loves me. He loves me. My father loves me. My father loves me. He loves me. They're going to kill your kids. My father loves me. He loves me. He loves me. My Your wife going to die. My father loves me and he loves my wife. And you fight this spirit of fear with the power of love. And God is love. So you are using God to fight the spirit of fear. God, who is love, is himself combating the spirit of fear. Glory be to God. 
The spirit of fear, we cannot let it loose. We cannot let it dominate and reign. I will not have it in this church. I'm not going to have it in my house. We do not tolerate the spirit of fear. I ain't going to jump behind you and try to scare you. And then all of a sudden you scared all of a sudden now. And we don't play that with our kids. The lights go out and, and woo, we don't do none of that because we don't play with the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear has caused people to not do what God's called them to do. 40 year olds still living with their mom and dad because they're scared to leave the house. Spirit of fear. Spirit of fear. Spirit of fear. And the first thing, how did that tragedy in Texas affect me? The first thing I thought about, the first response that hit me was fear. That was the first thing that came when I heard about it. Fear came. Man, we can't even gather together without, without some noise, checking somebody at the door. And I refuse to be a church. Yes, we're going to be wise. We're going to be wise. I promise you that. But we, if, if visitors, first time guests, weird looking people, I don't care. They are welcome in this church. Amen. They're welcome. We're not going to be scared of nobody. Amen. No fear. Oh, we need to check that guy. No, we, yeah, be wise, but then welcome him in the church and say, you are, we glad you're here. Come worship our, our great God with us. Glory be to God. Spirit of fear is not allowed up in here. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but that sounded good. The spirit of fear, say that after me. The spirit of fear is not allowed up in here. Amen. It's not proper English, but you know what I'm talking about. No fear here. Psalms 112 verse 7. It says that the righteous man, he, he, he does not fear bad news. He confidently trusts the Lord to care for him. I don't fear bad news. I confidently trust the Lord to care for me. And so the first response when I hear this bad news was fear. Fear came and I began to attack the spirit of fear. No fear here. My father loves me. We will not walk in fear. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from all my fear. I do not fear bad news. I confidently trust the Lord to take care of me. I'm telling you what, God has not given me the spirit of fear. And whatever God has not given, I do not want. I don't want anything that he has not given me. And I will stand against and resist with everything I have this fear because fear has bondage. Fear will tell you what you can and can't do. People, some people scared to jump on an airplane. They're not scared of flying. They're scared of dying. And they won't go somewhere the quickest route because fear told them, don't get on that plane. I know a guy, he's afraid to drive over bridges. So he'll take whatever way there's a bridge, he's not going to take that way. He's going to take another way. And even though you can be five, ten minutes away, just cross over the bridge, he'll, he'll go an hour just to not get a bridge. Fear's telling him what to do. Fear. And the greatest fear is the fear of death. So you're not afraid of spiders. You're afraid of a spider biting you. And then when the spider bites you, it's going to kill you. Or the pain that comes with the spider. That's what you're afraid of. Because if you weren't afraid of you just you just step on the spider. But you're afraid he's going to bite me. And then this, this happens in the little kids. My, my son, Zayman, come running up. He said he was running away from a cat or something. And the cat going to bite me. No, have you ever been bitten by a cat? Never. He's never been bitten by, never. But now the cat's going to bite. Have you, has, a, has the teeth ever even, has his mouth ever even opened? Never, but he's going to bite me. See, the, the fear, you, you start being irrational, delusional, because fear is telling you what to do. But if we can conquer this fear of death, because in Hebrews 2, Jesus set us free from the fear of death. And number two that I want you to see, is that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Glory be to God. There is no delay. If something were to happen to you today and you're a believer and you leave this body, immediately you will be in the presence of the Lord. Glory be to God. So why should a Christian fear when you know that your eternal destination is heaven? And to be with God, why should you fear? Man, 
those people in Texas, when they immediately left their body, they immediately got in the presence of the Lord. Glory be to God. Paul says in Philippians chapter one, verse 21, Paul said to live is all right, but to die is gain. He said it was better to depart this earth. To live is Christ, but to die is better. And so, yes, that affected me when I heard about this in Texas in the church shooting. I was like, oh, my goodness. And they, in one family, I heard just the entire family tree was gone. Everybody was lost in the spirit of God. As I was grieving and mourning and, and sad, the spirit of God said, they're with me. So what he told me, they're with me. Glory, hallelujah. They're with me. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when we're absent from this body, understand that you are going to be immediately translated into the presence of God. And, and man, what, what a reward it is to be in the presence of God. See, if the enemy can keep us fearful, then he can control us. And if he can control us, he can tell us what to do. But when we're not afraid to die, Glory be to God. We're not afraid to die. We become fearless. Doing whatever God can tells us to do. Not afraid. And I believe that the families, as they're grieving and mourning over their lost family members, yes, that's appropriate. You can, you can cry and grieve and, and miss your lost ones, but understand they're in heaven. They're in a better place. They're in a better place. Number three, as I think about the Texas shooting, the third thing that, that really impressed me was prepare to live forever, but act and behave as if you can leave at any moment. Prepare to live forever, but act and behave as if you could leave any moment. How does that tragedy affect you, Pastor Devon? Man, I tell you what, I'm preparing to live forever. Long life will he satisfy me, show me his salvation. But I'm acting and behaving and thinking and responding as if I could leave at any moment. I'm even in the natural preparing some things for my family so I don't leave them in debt, broke, busted, and disgusted preparing some things that if I leave at any moment, now I got an assignment on my life. I ain't going nowhere. Nor, I ain't going nowhere soon. Okay. But if I decide to leave at any moment, amen, my family's going to be taken care of. Church family's going to be taken care of. Glory be to God. I want to prepare to live forever, but I'm going to act and behave as if any moment. I, and what does that mean? I'm, I don't want to cuss you out because you know, I, 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 I don't want to act crazy. I want to walk around with unforgiveness and I don't like this person. And that person don't like me. And, and you mad at your husband or you mad at your spouse. Or, uh, I, I don't want to do that. Amen. I want, I want that to be behind me because at any moment I can meet my maker. And although I'm prepared to be here for a long time, I'm going to act as if I can leave any time. Number four, give your life to Jesus. Make sure that you give your life to Jesus, that you rededicate your life, that you, whatever the case may be, it makes sure that all of your heart has been given to Jesus. Make sure that he is Lord, not just Savior, but Lord, which means master of your life. Make sure that Jesus is the one in command of your life, that you set everything else aside and Jesus is the one. When I think about the tragedy in Texas, I think about, is my life right? Is my love walk right? Have I given my heart to the Lord? Is he leading and guiding? Am I doing what he's telling me to do? And so the four things we need to think about. Don't worry about why did this happen? Where was God and all that stuff? 
How does this affect me? Number one, resist the fear. Number two, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. It's better to die. Think about what a, what a thorn in the enemy's flesh we would be if we all lived a fearless life. I mean, he couldn't, I mean, his whole tactic is fear. And if we leave a fearless life, think about the thorn in his flesh that we'll be. If we're not afraid, especially of dying. It's not the worst thing that can happen to a Christian. Say this out to me. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to a believer. It's not the worst thing. Matter of fact, Paul said it's the best thing. Number three, prepare to live forever, but act and behave as if you can leave at any moment. And number four, make sure you have given your life to Jesus. How does this affect me? The title of this message is, why did this happen? Why did this happen? I don't know why it happened, but this is how it affects me. I'm going to resist the fear. Hallelujah. I'm going to know that if I depart this earth, I'm going to be in the presence of God immediately. No delay. I'm going to, act. I'm going to prepare to live forever by my act and behave as if any moment could be my last. Number four, I'm going to make sure I've given my life to Jesus. Amen. Amen.